following interview is being conducted with Dr. Connie Weaver for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It's taking place on May the 20th, 2019 at 2 o'clock p.m. at Purdue University. The interviewer is Katie Watson, the France A. Cordova archivist. Okay, so Connie, um, can you tell me a bit about your early life? So like when and where were you born? A bit about your parents, if you have any siblings. So I was born in 1950 in a very small town of about 1400 in um, northeastern Oregon. Actually, I was born 15 miles away in La Grande, Oregon, where there was a hospital, but oh, I grew okay. up, I, my parents, uh, Bob and Avril Shelton, mm -hmm. lived in Union, Oregon. Oh, okay. And it didn't have a hospital. It didn't have any kind of... Uh, fast food restaurant or bowling alley or anything wow. to do. So uh, growing up, enjoying nature and participating in outdoor activities was a um, very important part of our life. The town was uh, mostly supported by local small farmers and there was a lumber industry, but not commercial manufacturing or that sort of city kind of life. My dad was one of these small farmers in the okay. beginning, but about that period is when it became um, not financially viable to run small farms. Okay. And my grandfather lived with us and he helped with irrigation, for example, but as he was getting older and it was more difficult for him to help on the farm and the financial outlook of the small farms, my dad started working in lumber, first in logging and then later in the sawmill. But when my grandfather couldn't keep up with irrigation and whatnot while he was at work, then he had to sell the farm, like so many oh, did okay. at that time. So I was about eight and we moved from outside on the farm, of outside of town to inside town. And then he just worked in lumber after that. And my mother stopped working in the court courthouse when I was born and she was a stay at home mom. But she got some income by making people's clothes and wedding oh, cakes cool. and things like that. So she was very active volunteer in the community and church. I learned work ethic from them and uh, to respect property and in the environment and to do it. We grew our own food and I really hardly had anything until I went to college that wasn't caught shot, <laughs> grown, <laughs> collected somehow, you wow. know. So we would grow really large gardens and my mom and I would process about 2,000 units of fruits and vegetables and jellies and jams and pickles and things every summer. Wow. So we, and our entertainment was camping on the weekends while we would fish or um, gather mushrooms or huckleberries or things that like that. so wonderful. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, it sounds more wonderful when you're <laughs> away. At the time, like when you're growing up in puberty, you're whining, you don't have any uh, movie theater, you don't have any <laughs> of these trappings that kids wanted to do. Mm -hmm. But now I just prize all my free time or vacations to go experience those outdoor yeah. kind of uh, situations, but why I say they taught me work ethic, well, we participated as a family to do these things, to grow the food and process it and preserve it and that sort of thing. Um, but also my mother had this attitude that if you are busy doing constructive things, then I won't assign you housework. So I spent many hours learning to play the piano or learning how to <laughs> sew and knit and crochet and 
preserved foods and everything to get out of housework. housework. <laughs> and and <Okay>. later, <laughs> yeah, no, later I think I wasn't so smart because I could have done 20 minutes of housework and played all the time <laughs> yes, instead yeah. of spending hours learning to do all these things. But so I would get up early in, in the summers and spend some hours doing all these productive things so that I could get out and be outside and play. And I was the kid that was the adventuresome one. So they always made me do everything first to test it out. Your friends I had or your family? My brother and our friends. Okay. So my brother was two years younger. And one of our main summer activities was floating down in inner tubes, this little creek. And so we would either bicycle up the creek to the park to get into the river or some combination of my parents retrieving us and taking us back up and we would spend miles a day floating down the creek. But there was like a five foot fall in this one place with an eddy underneath. and. So every spring, I had to be the first one to go down and make sure it was okay or <laughs> <laughs> to before anybody else would go down, that sort of thing. And that fit me just fine. <laughs> Did you have life jackets or anything? No, but it, you could stand was, up in oh, the okay, creek. Okay. The, the biggest danger were hitting the sharp rocks oh, on okay. the low yeah. <laughs> season or the bushes and thorns and things okay. going by, but... Yeah, it was a wonderful childhood. Yeah, it sounds like it. <laughs> and so, were you? So you moved into the town of Union after right. your father sold the farm, right? And then, so is that where you went to school? Correct. Okay. Um, well, I'd already started school. I'd taken the bus mm -hmm. in before, but when we moved in town, I was only three blocks from school. So oh, I could walk, and the grade school, the middle school, and the high school were all similar. And I had 31 kids in my class in high school, and the grade schools were split. So I was like third and fourth might be together, and fifth and sixth or okay. something. And so um, half of the class was getting instruction from the teacher in the room where the other half was doing homework or something okay. silent. And I credit that to my ability to focus and tune out everything. It, mm -hmm. I never suffered from distractions from getting my work done. Oh, that's and good. And I think that was good training <laughs> from that. Awesome. Okay, cool. Um, so you mentioned that your father, so you lived in a, or you grew up in kind of a farming community. Correct. Is that kind of what inspired you to go into food and nutrition? Um, I would say it's part of the story, but my mother was the 4-H teacher. And in uh, Oregon, unlike what my children experienced here in Indiana, the 4-H the clubs were small and subject matter focused. So in my case, we did home ec type uh, projects and my mother was the teacher and it was a group of girls. And so all of our meetings were the next learning process of whatever topic we're in. So we would do sewing for so many weeks and canning for so many weeks and cooking for so many weeks and that sort of thing. And we would work our way through the lessons all together. So okay. they all came, uh, my friends, there were about eight of us all came to my house and my mom taught them how to do their life skills, basically. And we would enter the county fairs and state fairs and we were completely prepared because we spent all year learning okay. the skills yeah. and uh, making our products for display. So we, we had lots of championships in the mm -hmm. county and then in the state we would compete and do well. And that was a big trip for us every year to Salem, the state capital okay. for the annual state fair and oh, present our fun. products or do stall show or cook dinners. Or mm -hmm. One year my brother and I um, won the state fair championship because oh, wow. uh, the president came out, the president of the country came out with a fitness program and he was advocating for all this schools to adopt 
fit, fitness principles in their classes. Okay. So we were demonstrating these fitness principles and that was a popular timely thing oh, okay. to do at that time. But so 4-H made me really comfortable in foods and nutrition mm -hmm. uh, and, and the agricultural community. So when I was to go to college, I loved math and science, all kinds of sciences, but I was very familiar and comfortable with food science and nutrition, so mm -hmm. it was sort of a natural oh, okay. match. And then, so, what made you, ch so you went to Oregon State for right. I, your bachelor's? We should back up just a minute okay. because it's unusual that I knew I wanted to be a scientist from third grade. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. And I knew I wanted to be a college professor from a freshman in high school. And so wow. I've had a very linear path to so you knew exactly what you right to do. and most people wander around and find their way I mm -hmm. was very linear in my goals and what turned me on to science in third grade is um, a, an important part of my molding I would say because my uh, teacher uh, encouraged in the individuality and my community wasn't that college oriented. You can imagine most people well, yeah, didn't have learning. degrees. I was the first generation to go to college in my family. And okay. um, anyway, so that was the context. And she gave me the opportunity to sort of grow. And this is very unusual and wouldn't happen too often. But so for about 20 minutes after lunch every day, she allowed me to uh, perform a demonstration for the whole class oh, okay. and so I would go figure out in the library or practicing at home experiments or some sort of science related topic to okay. do so I learned because I wanted to present to the class yeah. you know it was really a wonderful motivation for me uh, with no agenda, you know, mm -hmm. just whatever I wanted. So I did everything from making rice paper to setting off rockets to, wow. you know, little electrical circuits to turn on a light bulb and anything I could find in the library that I could make at home. That's awesome. <laughs> so and that then, so your fun. teacher encouraged, so you had a really supportive teacher right. that encouraged you to do right. this. Right. Well, who else and, would allow one kid to yeah. take 20 minutes a day? Yeah. You know? And... So did she recognize that you were really adept at science, like in sciences and maths, or did you approach her and tell her this was something that you wanted to do? Um, I doubt if I, it's a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, so I, I doubt if I approached her, she probably allowed me to do it once or something. Yeah. And then, well, anytime you want to do it, we'll make room or something. Okay. So I'd wanted to do it every single day. <laughs> Or most oh, days, awesome. anyway. That's my memory. I am connected with her before she passed away in her later years when she was in a institutional living so we could reminisce on okay. how wonderful that was for my She must growth. have been really proud of you as well. Well, that's what I learned through my mother is why I made a point to go look her up and visit her. Okay. In her so she followed later your years. career? Yeah. Oh, wow. Probably through my mother and newspaper, maybe. That's amazing. Yeah, so that and was pretty fun. Did you have her through high school as well? No, I just had her the one year. Oh, okay. In third grade, that's when I knew wow. I wanted to be a scientist. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. And then did you have any other like mentors throughout grade school and high school that like really encouraged you to go through science? Um, or that recognized I would say my science? math teacher in high school, Bill Phillips was good at trying to stimulate you into uh, working hard at your homework and being better at math. But it, um, his style of motivation was not nurturing like that. <laughs> it was, well, you know you're just going to be a, 
a little, you're a big fish in a small pond here, but you're going to be a little fish in a big pond when you go to college. Your GPA will drop at least a whole grade. And, Oh, so that it's sort of <laughs> that sort of thing, and so I guess that challenged me to show him my grades didn't drop yeah. <laughs> when I went to college, and, um, that I could be successful anywhere. Prob maybe he knew it all along, and that was just yeah. his motivational style. But I didn't think he thought I could do it <laughs> at the time. That's for sure. So then in college. It, um, I went to a land grant university and then Purdue. I worked in a yeah. land grant university. It's a fitting that it's land grant with my yeah. upbringing, my interest. I would say this integrating of science to an applied pathway. Um, it, uh, I was. I've already mentioned that I loved the outdoors and I was mm -hmm. in adventure. So when we went around to look at what the clubs had to offer at Oregon State the first week on campus and what we wanted to sign up for. I was told then the same thing we tell our students here with the many clubs that are at Purdue, you should pick one activity at least in your professional domain to build okay. your leadership skills, but do one personally okay. as well. So mm -hmm. I signed up for skydiving. Wow, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I went skydiving all year and my parents came to, across the state to visit um, in the spring and I hadn't told them I was doing this. Do you want to come see me skydive? My dad <laughs> about freaked out <laughs> and we went out and looked at the field but he didn't want to watch me jump. No, yeah. I could imagine he wouldn't want to see that. <laughs> so that was pretty funny. That's great. So I did get involved and became a leader in the college level and discipline level social activities. So okay. that was a good growing experience there. And my senior year, I uh, married my husband, Lloyd Weaver, a little earlier than I imagined I would marry because he was a naval officer. He okay. was two years ahead of me. We we'd met when I was a sophomore and he was uh, graduating senior in organic chemistry laboratory. And he um, was leaving for the Navy and it was Vietnam War era. Oh, okay. So when he found out he was going to Vietnam, he wanted to get married because he thought I would forget him. Oh. And as it turned out, he had back-to-back -back tours mm -hmm. and he's probably right. I probably would have not remembered or stuck with him. And, and I was pretty afraid to do that, but my parents really encouraged me to. I think they were a little worried that I might become a spinster, or a homemade <laughs> spinster or something, and th thought I, they wanted to be sure I had a personal life too, oh, so okay. they thought he would fill that bill, I think. So we got married at Christmas time, my senior year okay. in college. What year was that? Um, so 1971 in December. Okay. So Lloyd then went off two weeks later after our honeymoon. And the next time I saw him was when he had an R&R &R in Hong Kong. And I went over for a little over a week and met up with him. And that was wildly um, exciting, yeah. you know, to go to Hong Kong. Then I, I actually had traveled because when, when I was in high school, when I was 16, I uh, signed up for this People to Be People High School Ambassador Tour. So okay. this group went around Europe to about 13 countries in the summer and four different places we lived in individually with families for about oh, okay. five days apiece. So That's really cool. it was really cool. And for a, for a girl from a really small town to yeah. um, reach out that far yeah. early, that early was very unusual from my wow. hometown. So, it, you know, it prepared me for 
a career that was international, ha- international yeah. in lots of respects. So I went over by myself to meet up with Lloyd in Hong Kong on this R&R, which didn't intimidate me, probably because of that high school, okay, that people to people ambassador tour in Europe. And so, of course, that was a lot of fun. And on the Navy exchange rates, and we had seven months of his salary saved up. He couldn't spend anywhere yeah. uh, on the ship. So we bought everything to set up a new apartment, you know, stereos and sewing machine and t- television and china and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all of those things. And he built a little fake roof above his bunk and put it all up there in the ship so he could <laughs> come home. But he came home, we were together about a month and a half, and he went out to Vietnam again. And so we only ended up living together about one year out of the first four years we were married. So I kept getting more degrees, which was something I wanted to do anyway. That was my goal. But it gave me the right opportunity, and then I could just completely focus and um, do a fast track on degrees which was healthier than other Navy wives because mm-hmm. being left alone that long. And it's an odd thing. You go from being sort of dependent because the Navy doesn't consider the spousal wishes, you know, they just, yeah. so it's dominant on the spouse, to then you have to be completely independent because they're off alone. Yeah. And that's really hard for people to have that sort yeah. of insecure, unstable environment and to shift around so many other navy wives did destructive behaviors you know okay. they would abuse substances or just spend all this money or mm-hmm. you know some sort of mental health crisis or you know yeah. all kinds of things but getting college degrees was a fairly a constructive yeah. <laughs> uh, opportunity for me so i did that and uh, um, then when he finally got through with those tours, we lived in San Diego for a year. In California? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Where he was with the Navy still. And I taught, uh, I had my master's by then, and I taught mm-hmm. in a junior college for a year, Girls oh, Want okay. Junior College. And then he got relocated to um, Rhode Island. And so University of Rhode Island mm-hmm. was pretty close, and I could take a bus ride over, and so I uh, worked as a research scientist in a lab the nine months we were there. And then he was um, assigned to go to Mayport, Florida, and the closest university was Florida State University, so I applied and enrolled there. But his PhD. For my PhD. And he um, was able to, his time was up while I was starting that degree and he could re-up which I think originally he thought he would do do but we'd been apart so much Mm -hmm. on all those years and it didn't look like that would change much so he decided to get out and so he came and got his MBA while I was finishing off my PhD at Florida State and then um, after that I was all signed up to do a postdoc at University of California at Davis Okay. When I was just for the heck of it applying for assistant professor positions, thinking yeah. I would have to Wait. get the postdoc, yeah. right? But I got this, uh, um, I started getting j- interviews, and I actually got a job offer at Purdue for assistant professorship. And I thought, okay, why would I do a postdoc to try to get the job I just got offered? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, so I skipped the postdoc, and Lloyd followed me then. He said it was my turn and oh, that's so awesome. came to Purdue in 1978 straight from a PhD. Then. Wow. wow, so you you both bounced a lot around a lot. But all on lived. the coast. Okay. So this was so the first was time in the Midwest. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, you were on the west. Right. And Oregon then, and California yeah. then, Rhode Island and Florida. Rhode Island, and then how long did you live in Rhode Island for? Was that really short? Yeah, like nine months. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then you worked, where did you work when you were at, in Rhode Island? At University of Rhode Island. Okay. And then Florida, and then to the Midwest. Right. So how was, so it sounds like your husband was really supportive. Yes. In moving with you, which is great. Right. 
Um, He's been supportive of me my whole career. That's amazing. Yeah, really good. Yeah, that's really refreshing. <laughs> really, really yeah. good. Yeah. That's awesome. But yeah, he how... didn't want to know which I would give up if I had to make a choice. <laughs> Well, <laughs> and I wanted to be a professor Especially for a lot knew, longer. Yeah, he knew from like grade three he wanted to go into That's the, right. the scientist. <laughs> he didn't want to mess with that. Yeah. Uh, so how how was it moving to the Midwest from like basically being on the like on the coasts your whole life? So, well, I was pretty excited about the job because yeah. it was exactly what I yeah. was aspiring to do. Um, recreationally, it was really a step down. <laughs> There's not water, mountains, you know. Yeah, it's pretty flat. But uh, fortunately, in my profession, I get to travel a lot, and we yeah. would spend our vacations going a lot of the time skiing or somewhere outdoors or seeing yeah. the family in Oregon or something. So it's not, I don't feel completely stuck here yeah. but I do need my fixes to go to the mountains and <laughs> <laughs> to the water pretty often and it was a wonderful community to raise a family in mm -hmm. you know the quality of life here is really good because I'm not spending time commuting in uh, things are easy I could bounce back and forth between my personal and professional life in minutes you know yeah. and in big cities you can't do that so that was really great our first impressions, though, I have to tell you, uh, the, it was really obvious that there was a lot of people overweight here compared to anywhere else we'd ever oh, okay. lived, and lots of sedentary behaviors okay. here. And that was a little depressing, but that became an opportunity to do my career work in, you know, okay. <laughs> and nutrition and yeah. fitness. Yeah, I found it. I moved from the West Coast as well mm. here, so, but I'm originally from Ontario. So. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. Okay. Oh, when you first came to Purdue, you were pregnant with your first child, right? Right, Doug. Yeah, so right when you started, how long after you started did you actually have Doug? How long after? When was he born? So I started in August and he was born in March. Oh, wow. Okay. And so how was that? I guess having a infant, right, as you're, you know, like you're in a tenure, you were in a tenure track position. I was, right? right. Yeah. So how, that must have been really challenging. Um, well, actually, having one wasn't so challenging. <laughs> But 20 months later came along twins, yeah. Mark and Brooke. <laughs> so having three kids yeah. within 20 months, that was exponentially more work yeah. and challenging. And I felt uh, some days I was so tired, I hope no student asked me my name. <laughs> <laughs> I might not be able to remember. It was exhausting. But... Um, I think it was easier juggling a career with three close together than single, okay. really, because now I have eight grandchildren, and uh, you know when they're separated, there is more tendency uh, play with me or let's do something. I'm bored, mm -hmm. and with my three all together who were a unit and played together all the time, if I would say. Um, can we do something together? Well, could it wait, Mom? We're kind of in the middle of something. <laughs> <laughs> That's really so, nice. They, they, could they could entertain <laughs> themselves. Not that I didn't do things with them, but I didn't feel like I was forced to entertain yeah. them. Okay, that's great. And then your did um, your husband stay at home with them at all? So he was teaching faculty only and not research so mm -hmm. in the summers he started staying home with him I mean the whole solution to how this worked is I had a nanny come to my house for the first about five and a half years okay. and she was awesome yeah. she ha had a lot of energy and I'd turn over about two-thirds of my salary <laughs> and it was worth it because she 
would come there and I didn't have to get them ready mm-hmm. for, to take somewhere before work. And then she would uh, start the laundry or dinner or something often yeah. when I'd come home. And that was That's huge. <laughs> yeah, that was huge. But the first uh, summer that Lloyd then stayed home with him after she wasn't doing that any longer was nearly a disaster. (laughs) He was trying to do some writing, but, and so, instead of watching them every minute, like they needed to be at that age, I would get called or alerted to something that was horrendous (laughs) going on at home. Like, he thought he would get them all watching this swashbuckler movie, mm-hmm. an Errol Flynn kind of movie, when it was all raining, and they had swords and things. Well, it, it became nice, and he sent them out in the backyard, play, and I'm going to write a little bit. Well, when he went to look for them, he looked in the backyard, and they weren't there. He ran around the front yard. They weren't there, but he could hear them. Finally, he looked up. They were on the roof with sticks, pretending they were swashbuckling, you know, uh, <laughs> pirates. And how did you get on the roof? Well, they had climbed the TV antenna and then pulled each other up from one level of this roof to the other, you know, climbed up the g- chimney, and they were clear on top of the house. And, you know, they were like three and five. <laughs> It was crazy. <laughs> it was crazy. So that was a interesting time. Really I was time pretty <laughs> afraid to <laughs> leave them every day. <laughs> but they made it. But they yeah. made it, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. So did a lot of other were there many other women in your department and did they also like have children as well or were you pretty much one of the only ones who like was working and had a family at the at this time as well um i was probably the only woman who was trying to do research okay and have family so one of my really good friends had children but she was a 10 month and taught Mm -hmm. so it's not the same um, demand or expectation you don't travel for one thing um, and she would have grading at night but she had summers off and she could grade after they would go to bed I mean I'm not belittling how much she had to do but it was a different expectation and then the research female faculty were single okay right Okay, so it was pretty unique then for you. At that time, it was fairly unique, yeah. Even though there were plenty of women in our college. Mm -hmm. But it was the research component. It was the research component, right. And then I loved you donated those cartoons by, I just can't remember the cartoonist's name, depicting you, like, working. Yeah. I love those. Those are probably, like, my favorite. (laughs) Thank you. So I, at that time, I was invited to give a talk to this social club to advise how to combine work and family. And it was a different time because you didn't readily um, say that you were leaving work during the day for taking your kid to a doctor's appointment okay. or anything that was personal. It was just not done yet at that time. And so to admit before I had tenure of how to combine work and family when you really were sort of expected to keep it hidden and separate, how do you do that? So that's when I got the idea of humor Mm -hmm. and had the cartoons drawn of how it really was (laughs) to do it so they could be laughing more than judging me, I yeah. guess, for okay. so how I combine it. it. <laughs> yeah, to kind of soften it and make it lighthearted. And also not to appear like I was complaining because, yeah. um, I mean, the kinds of things you have today with dedicated spaces for breastfeeding or, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, 
childcare facilities like right on cor campuses. Correct. Uh, all of the things that are part of the expectations today that weren't there then. It's a different era. And it took people, some people did need to complain and mm -hmm. struggle to make those changes. But uh, I coped in different ways, I yeah. suppose. But, you know, and when I got tenure, my dean said, um, I wasn't betting you could get tenure wow. and have three children. So that yeah. was the expectation that it just wouldn't work, yeah. that combination. Instead of congratulations, yeah. <laughs> you, maybe you managed it. Yeah, <laughs> I thought, yeah like, maybe wow, it was. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it was, but I, it stuck with me. That was yeah. <laughs> quite the thing to say. <laughs> yeah, so there weren't many supports for work, working moms in no. like kind of faculty yeah, not yet. positions. Not yet. Oh. And even now, some of the things that you think are supportive, um, backlash that aren't. For example, you can ask for a year off for maternity leave in terms of a tenure track clock extension. Okay. But what that does is put you um, at a lower salary for another year longer. Oh, and so okay. it widens the salary gap between oh, okay. males and females. Okay. And people aren't thinking of these bigger picture consequences. Yeah. And a lot of women can take some maternity leave and still make the tenure track clock, yeah. and they're better off financially if they don't delay. Yeah. But it's the conservative nature, it seems like, of many administrators to say, oh, just to be sure, why don't you take that extra time? Uh -huh. And they're not either side, neither side is, are thinking, oh, that would put my salary back yeah. substantially yeah. Okay. for another year, which compounds it throughout yeah. your entire career then every time you do that yeah yeah i know i wouldn't have thought of that either mm. it's better to go early as you can <laughs> did you have mat leave when you started like so maternity leave when my oldest child was born was five weeks mm -hmm. and then by the time the twins were born um in 1980 it was seven weeks so pretty short. Yeah. Okay. I think it's like three months now or something. And that's still way behind Scandinavia. Yeah. Well, I'm Some from Canada, so it's a year, I think. Yeah, see? Yeah. A lot different. A lot different, but... A lot different. Still a little bit longer. Yes, right. <laughs> yeah, right. that's a really short... That must have been hard to come back after... Well, the only way I got some rest was after I had the twins. The <laughs> twins. When you became head of the department for food and nutrition, foods and nutrition, right? Um, there was someone else. So at that time, um, another head position came out, and it was given to Doug, yeah. Doug Powell. Yeah, and there was this controversy about a very significant salary gap between the two of you, even though you had fairly comparative experience and you were actually at Purdue for longer. Right, but our promotion from assistant to associate professor was the same year, and mm -hmm. then our promotion from associate to full professor was the same year. And he was coming in from the outside to take this department yeah. head position, and I was internal. Yeah. And it came out in the newspaper that, mm -hmm. with our picture that both of us were appointed, and it showed the salary. Oh my gosh, that started a yeah. firestorm because everywhere I went that weekend um, to church or the post office, any, the grocery store, anywhere, people were saying, wow, I saw your salary is so much lower than the mail. Why was that? That shame on Purdue kind of thing. Yeah. It was so awkward and embarrassing. I felt betrayed, you know. Yeah. And... So the next morning, or Monday morning, rather, I um, came into the dean's office with a copy of the newspaper and put it on his desk, and I said, how do we, you explain this? Yeah. And he said, I've had an, already received enough copies of that newspaper article to wallpaper my office <laughs> with. He said, but what do you expect me to do about it? 
and, and he, you know, his excuse or whatever was just that the that's what the man negotiated, that's what I negotiated, and that's where it was. Oh, <laughs> you know, how to make me feel even worse. <laughs> yeah, but that's yeah. all, like, it was, like, you put, could you even yeah. negotiate it? Enough to like bring it back up to that. It was, was $11,000 difference. Yeah. And so I was going to make 69000 and Doug Powell was going to make 11000 more than me. And I, um, he said, well, what would you have me do about it? Take money away from your faculty? I go, no, I wouldn't want you to do that. But you better do something about it because I have appointments with the right offices on campus. Mm -hmm. um, equal opportunity and so forth that I will keep later this week if nothing's done about it because I was worried the faculty would think I couldn't negotiate with him on their behalf if I couldn't even negotiate yeah. my own salary it put me in a really awkward leadership disadvantage yeah. so he said well I'll call the provost equivalent now but executive okay. vice president then Robert Ringel and I'll get back to you. Well, he got back to me right away for an appointment yet early that afternoon. Mm -hmm. And I came in to his office and he said, um, here's a blank piece of paper, write down what you want. Ringel said, I'm to give you whatever you say. Oh, wow. <laughs> right, yeah. so that was his interpretation of how to handle that. <laughs> and so, wow, what do I do? And I thought uh, I could ask for the whole gap mm -hmm. or I could make a more long-term strategic choice for the relationship the way I saw it. So I wrote down a number halfway between mm -hmm. and I said I wanted you to know that uh, I appreciate what you're doing for me and the I'll be able to tell the faculty that I renegotiated so we can talk. But I also want you to know I can compromise. I'm a reasonable person. So I felt that was a, the right thing to do. But I'm reading this book now that is called, it's a fairly new book that was published last year. And it was it's called Invisible Women. Okay. It's a... Let me see. I wrote it down for this, but now I'm not finding where I wrote it down. It's called Invisible Women, um, Exposure to a, a Gender Bias, you know, okay. a world of data based on men, basically. Okay. And so this book talks about how men negotiate salaries better and that's what my husband was telling me too that you did something about it but you didn't go up the full way so you're still not negotiating the way a man does and he negotiated that and you didn't um, but this book's premise is you learn throughout your life here's the male role here's the female role and uh, women are trained to be more nurturing and compromising and yeah and so okay maybe <laughs> you know like um, why aren't women more like men is that how we <laughs> handle the situation or do we make an environment that's more fair I don't yeah. know um, yeah. but I've heard that argument as well that women just aren't as good at negotiating but there is you are taught from a young age to like compromise and to create this like um like to create good relationships and yeah not to kind of you know push too hard so i read an article in chemical and engineering news once about the difference between male and female faculty mentors mm -hmm. for their students and um more often than not, a woman mentors by nurturing and empowering and motivating. Okay. And a man motivates by competition. 
You know, he'll give yeah. like two people the same project to see who gets there first or okay. whatever. Yeah. Completely different styles yeah. of motivating. It's, it's all part of that. Yeah, and it's interesting to think about like how much of that is taught. Here, I found the name of that book. It's a 2019 book by Carolyn um, um, let's see if I can read that. Uh, Criado uh, Purpa. I have to look it up. And anyway, Invisible Women Data Bias in a World Designed for Men. Okay. That was the name of the book. I haven't read that. I'm, I'm going to look that up. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the a lot of your research while you've been here at Purdue um, has been focused on women's health, um, specifically in relation to calcium. Um, what what got you into specifically women's health and focusing in on calcium? What interested you about that? I started work with minerals in my PhD and created a, a lot of methods using isotopic tracers. Okay. At the time, the, my major professor at Florida State University had a, a friend and colleague who was head of physics at another university, and there had been a radioactive spill, like okay. a, a nuclear power plant spill or something, and he was asking her do you really have to cordon off the fields for 30 years or whatever and not grow anything, or could you do something to the vegetables or whatever and process them so they'd be safe? So she asked if I'd like a project based on that concept. So I took the radioisotopes that were common to a, a nuclear spill, cesium and strontium, that had really long half-lives, and started labeling plants with them, vegetable crops, and fi found out where the tracer went and if you could process them out and make certain foods and whatnot. I think just for the political optics, you would cordon off the field and not let them grow anything for 30 years. But I learned that you could, like if you grew cucumbers, you could pickle them and lose 95% of the radioactivity. Okay in that process. So there are steps you could take if you were really stuck. But to learn how to label the plants, um, I learned to grow plants hydroponically. Okay. Because otherwise you put in the tracers and they just stick to the clay matter in the soil and don't go up into the crop. So I learned how to make hydroponic solutions and how to build a hydroponic system and uh, do all the parts with plants, but that was not unfamiliar to me because of all the 4-H and yeah. processing that I'd done growing up, but the radioisotope tracer techniques. So I took all the classes in um, isotopic tracers and whatnot, and I ultimately became a teaching assistant in chemistry at Florida okay. State teaching radiochemical techniques, mm -hmm. and that set me up well to look at essential um, minerals for mm -hmm mineral nutrition when I came to Purdue and then I had all these techniques that I could use to study tracers how they're taken up by crops and the edible portions and how processing affects them and then how bioavailable are the minerals to animal models or to humans and from there how do they link up to disease so I did studied a lot of different minerals initially selenium iron molybdenum zinc, um, quite a few different minerals, but where funding was the best was with calcium, okay. because about that period of time, they were starting to connect that diet had a role in whether or not a person developed osteoporosis later okay. in life. So it, the term was coined, um, osteoporosis is a pediatric disease. You start oh. young deciding if your bones making life's choices that either make strong bones build mm -hmm. strong bones or weak bones and make you vulnerable to fracture later in life okay. so this long latency disease process was starting to catch on and people were starting to link up that maybe what you ate 
or how you exercised or whatever early in life influenced your risk of hip fracture later in life. So that was just coming out in the magazines and things around in the 1980s. So because it was becoming popular and visible, this link, um, I, I was uh, thinking of writing grants to relate calcium, even though at that point I hadn't yet studied calcium, mm -hmm. but I thought that would be a really good thing that would catch more notice yeah. than these other trace elements that I had been studying. And sure enough, and it, so funding became a lot easier with yeah. calcium than anything else, so I grew my career mostly around calcium then for awesome. a long time. And so how do you study how much calcium do you need in youth yeah. to build the strongest bones to prevent fracture? And that's when... Um, we thought of how to design camp, a camp, a research yeah. camp study where we could bring kids into campus and live with them, house them, where we can control their diet mm -hmm. and have different levels of calcium or whatever we wanted to study and follow them long enough to see are they retaining the calcium or how much are they retaining at different levels so that we could determine how much calcium would optimize okay. developing peak bone mass. Okay. And then so camp calcium lent for two two decades, right? It was it, the first one was in nineteen ninety mm -hmm. and the eleventh one was in two thousand and ten. Okay, yeah. And then did you have participants like come back to test? Like how long or was it just you tested different participants? Mostly mostly it camp? was different. We wanted to study them during their rapid growth period of okay. puberty. So for girls, that was um, 12 to 14 mostly, maybe 11 to 14. And boys, it's mostly 13 to 15 because okay. their um, accelerated bone growth is delayed a bit from okay. girls. And then they get taller yeah. <laughs> when it's delayed. Um, so it, it, the grant cycle, sometimes I would run... Um, a camp back to back from one year to the other, but sometimes there would be a gap while we're analyzing all the samples and mm -hmm. getting ready f for future grants kind of thing, and there would be a little gap. So it depends if they were in the same age range that was eligible for the next camp. Oh, so okay. some so did okay. come back. One camp was designed to bring kids back, girls back. So we studied them when they were initially 12 to 14, and then we brought them back three years later oh, okay. when they were 15, 16 okay. year olds and to see how they weren't really growing much more bone by that time. They okay. were already much more like an adult, stable adult, adult growth structure. at that. Okay. But what we did have happen is a lot of siblings would come or relatives or... And sometimes the next generation of okay. family because it was over such a long yeah. period of time. And, or they would come and work. I mean, some of the kids as adolescents would be participants in camp, and then there would be college students and come be camp counselors oh, cool. for uh, oh, wow. next camps. So were most of the participants from the Lafayette, like the Tippecanoe County area? Uh, well, there were always some from there, but... We reached out around five states mostly, okay. so Indiana and the surrounding states when we were growing into larger numbers of okay. camps. Yeah. How did you select participants? Like, did they just have to be between that age range? It depended on the particular study. Mm -hmm. um, g generally healthy kids, okay. you know, we, we weren't prepared to handle diabetics, say, or... Mm -hmm. Uh, certain types of kids, but um, and they couldn't be on any kind of medication that would interfere with cal calcium metabolism. Okay, S but most kids aren't. You know, yeah. most kids fit in that. So, how we recruited them depended on the era. So, in the beginning, it was almost exclusively through schools. Okay. We would send a letter out to the superintendents of schools and say could we contact your principals and either offer flyers to distribute and then they call us or we would do 
uh, little presentations on nutrition and bone health, and then we could give out flyers in camp. So we had a combination of that. And often, by the time I'd get back to the office from giving a presentation, I would have an inbox full of phone messages of oh, wow. kids that wanted an application to oh, apply cool. for camp. So that was very popular. But then when schools got more into worrying about standardized exams, mm -hmm. they didn't want very much time given to outsiders for presentations because oh, they okay. had so all their minutes devoted to preparing the kids for standardized exams. Oh, so okay. it was lots more difficult to get into schools. Sometimes they would pass around flyers, but... Um, it was the personal presentations that did more good. And then we did uh, many camps that were trying to compare different races. So it wouldn't have been fruitful to go to a class that had 60 to 90 percent white kids when we were looking only for Hispanics or Chinese Americans or something like okay. that. So we used different uh, strategies. For the Hispanics, we um, paid for consensus data addresses and we would ask for in this five state area do you, is there a family with a middle school child between these grades and so then we'd buy that mailing list and send them postcards and if they were interested they asked for an application uh, for the Chinese American, we did some recruiting in these other ways, but mostly we went to Chinatown in Chicago and they recruited for us. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, and then so you, so you studied the differences between cal calcium absorption between different... All aspects of calcium okay. metabolism. Calcium oh. absorption, bone formation rates, bone... Okay. Resorption rates, excretion rates, okay. lots of things about yeah. them. Did you find big differences? We found some differences, like boys are more efficient than girls at any given calcium intake. And okay. that's, so our question was, do they get bigger skeletons because they're more efficient, or do they need more calcium and their requirements should be higher? Okay. And they were just more efficient at okay. absorbing and retaining the calcium than the girls. Okay. Um, a, con constantly across the intake okay. level, so they, their requirements are the same. Okay. And that was comparing white boys and girls. Then um, blacks are just more efficient. They're, they're more efficient than whites, just like boys are more efficient than girls. So they're genetically okay. programmed to have a bigger bone mass. Okay. And adult black women have on average 10% more bone mass than adult white men, or women. Okay. And that it's because of the way they handle calcium in adolescence and oh, grow the okay. bone then. And then they, it comes together and they're the same by adults, but okay. in puberty, they're programmed differently. The group that requires the least are Chinese girls. Okay. So they were much more efficient at absorbing calcium at low calcium intakes than any other race. And they plateaued earlier, so their okay. intake requirements a lot less. Mm -hmm. But it's still more than many Asian cultures get. Okay. So we still need to encourage it, okay. but their requirements don't have to be as high. As high. Okay. And then these findings influence, or yeah, influence the recommendation they, recommendation guidelines for the FDA? They, they establish the nutrient intakes for adolescents for North America since 1997. Okay, and they wow. still... And they still do. And they still do. Wow. Right. And then, so with those recommendations, does like... So there are these differences between gender and race. Do those... Are those incorporated into the guidelines? Or is it kind of like an average of what you found? So remember, the boys utilize calcium more efficiently than the girls and the blacks than the whites, but the intake requirements are the same because oh, they plateau at okay. the same. The Chinese Americans mm -hmm. were lower, and there's just a comment in that section, but they didn't actually specify a oh, okay. lower intake yep. um, in the 
law. Okay. They, in the policy, they didn't come up. Okay, so this just lower. In the um, guidelines, the recommendations, it just says what the intake level should be, not the absorption rate. Correct. Okay. Okay. Well, the whole report describes all this. Yeah, yeah, but that's probably this. <laughs> but the recommendations <laughs> yeah. just come out, here's what yeah. you need, right. Okay. Wow, so that was, and at this camp, um, people were kind of attracted to it because you had, like, activity, like, it was like a summer camp, right? Like, it was fun. So we, <laughs> yes, um, we rented initially uh, fraternities, sororities mm -hmm. for the summer to live in. And when the administration heard boys were coming, they decided that the, they didn't have enough uh, control over the housing okay. of fraternities, so they made us move to residence halls, okay. which was um, a blessing and a curse. It cost four times as much oh, no. to live in the residence halls as the fraternities, okay. so it cost the grant you know, federal government a whole lot more to run the camps. But you had these individual rooms for sleeping instead of sleeping porches. And okay. the most difficult thing, the challenging thing, is if you have 50 kids in one sleeping porch, if anybody's awake and noisy, they're keeping them all awake. Yeah. And so there was so much sleep deprivation that yeah, to deal with and right in those sleeping porches it was really a nightmare and no cell phones at that time so there might be three telephones in a sorority say mm -hmm. and they would line up and fight over who gets to <laughs> get on the phone to call somebody they wanted that was always a egregious problem yeah. in the residence halls they had their own sleeping rooms so if one kid is awake and noisy at least he's not bothering all the rest of him and they all had a phone in their own oh, room okay. so oh, we didn't that have that fight. so it solved a couple of okay. the problems yeah right. what kind of activities did the kids do like at the camp so a typical day would be in the morning we would do something educational mm -hmm. and all of the colleges at purdue were involved so some days we would take them to an engineering lab okay. or we a physics or chemistry show or we'd go to the vet school and watch them run thoroughbred horses on a treadmill to look for oh, okay. fr fractures or yeah. stress fractures or something. We just did every single thing pretty much that Purdue had to offer that they okay. would receive these um, kids in and that really influenced their college plans in lots of cases or their okay. major plans so some of them had not thought about even going to college in medical mm -hmm. middle school and then this exposed them to a wide variety of topics and um we got a, a lot of purdue recruits yeah. too <laughs> out of this so then the afternoons were we divide them into groups and so before snack some of them would go to the co-rec for some recreation and some would be in crafts, and then they'd come back for snack, and then they'd trade. Okay. So it was typically craft or uh, some physical recreation. And then at night, it could be anything from movie night to talent show to all kinds of things yeah. that we would create. And then we would do some outings throughout the camp, like canoe trips or go to a oh, baseball cool. game or go to Chicago to a museum or things like that so we did try to make it where they really enjoyed being there awesome and had you had like how did you plan this had you had any experience like planning a camp and how many participants did you have like that must, must have been a lot of work <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a lot of work it's, it's as much work planning all the activities in the camp as it is the research yeah. and so we would spend all year getting ready for it not uh, the research part, the sample, labeling all the tubes and getting all the methods worked out and everything, um, and also setting up uh, uh, all the activities in the recreation, which was a lot of work. So we had three different groups of people we hired. Mm -hmm. We would hire 
camp counselors because they had to be supervised 24 7 mm -hmm. you know their kids so we had to have people on night duty and people with them all the time everywhere they went and especially during meal time because they have to eat everything that we prepared them so yeah. you had at each table you have two adults watching that they ate everything which okay. is weighed out to the nearest tenth of a gram every single yeah. ingredient <laughs> you know and they have to eat everything and rinse the glasses of milk with deionized water to make sure they got it all and wow. that sort of thing okay. so they had to eat everything so then you have the kitchen staff preparing all of this so if you make a pizza you don't just get a slice of pizza you have to weigh individually the amount of dough the amount of tomato sauce the amount of cheese the amount of pepperoni whatever is in that pizza for each individual because it has to be exactly okay. right and you have different calorie needs so maybe you have colored dots to mark um, this is blue, so it's a 1,200-calorie diet, and this is red, so it's a 2,800-calorie diet. You know, we might have five different calorie levels that you have to keep track of, so a different weight for and that's everything. Based, is that based on, like, the different weights of different children? Yeah, and, and their physical activity yeah. levels. So okay. what they're, we didn't want them to gain or lose weight. We wanted weight stable, so okay. we planned menus for them that would provide okay. that for them. So you had the kitchen staff that worked long hours because three meals and two snacks a day for all of these children yeah. is a lot of work. And then you have the lab staff. So they're collecting all their urine and all their stools the entire time. And most studies were six weeks, two, okay. three week periods. So all of those samples, plus we'd collect blood a lot, depending on the study and different other kinds of measurements. So there was a lot of processing in the laboratory as well. So I would hire over 100 people in the summer to wow. do all these different functions. And so then there was training before the kids would come and then all year sample analysis and then statistical analysis That's after. The so the first camp was a lot smaller while okay. we l learned everything we had 14 kids and we compared their data with the counselors so we studied the counselors that oh, were supervising okay. them at the same time but we got it pretty right in terms of the research because we used pretty much the same methods for the entire set of 11 camps after that, okay. we really didn't have to make very many changes. It, it was well conceived. But by the last camp, we recruited 90 and retained about 70 okay, so to, to finish. People. Drop out sometimes. Okay. Now, usually in the first four days is when you lose the most because they get homesick or something, or they okay. really can't handle eating that controlled diet. Okay. Um, sometimes somebody will sneak in that they're they're a picky eater and the parents think we're going to fix that that doesn't oh. work you know <laughs> when you have to eat a whole diet set some people don't know they get homesick because they've never been away from home before and they mm -hmm. just get clinically homesick in four days well parents handle that really differently so some parents the first call they come and pick them up and take them away Another parent will say, you committed to this, and I want you to learn to, to honor your commitments. So I'm going to come over every mealtime, if the meal's the problem, or to visit if there's some social problem, and I'm going to stay with you until you feel comfortable. And sometimes they would come from long distances and do that every day for a week or more until the kid had adjusted but they got their kid to feel comfortable to stay. Okay. Um, so we kind of let the parents help monitor whether they should take them or leave them. But I really admired that if they could That's work awesome. with their child to honor their commitment. Because a lot of times they would say, I really want to do this. It's important to me to do this. I just feel... Um, homesick or whatever but the parent could help yeah help them through that and so that was yeah. wonderful but on average we'd lose about 15 percent of the okay. kids if they made it past the four days 
Um, but then it's usually about some drama thing in their life that made them feel like they needed to be home or something. Okay. It wasn't homesickness anymore, typically, okay. after that. But one reason it was so successful is we had quite the research team that lasted almost the entire time. So we had um, like George McCabe and his wife Linda McCabe in statistics okay. that did statistics analysis. Um, the, the physician, the study physician Monroe Peacock, who is an expert in his own right in um, kidney, like calcium and vitamin D and kidney handling and osteoporosis from IU School of Medicine. Berdine Martin was the project director. Um, we had a pretty stable lab staff supervisor, Anya. Um, Kempa was with us for basically that whole time, but then Pam Lechik came on and they both helped manage the staff. And then the kitchen staff, Started out with Olivia Bennett Wood, who was on faculty in nutrition science, and then Lisa Jackman and Jan Buckles. There were some turnover there, but it's still quite a continuity of years mm -hmm. each. And NIH said they just never heard of that, where a clinical staff would stay intact, working together for decades. Wow. So. And so they were all at Purdue, so. Well, except for the uh, IU. Yeah. And um, our kinetic modeler, uh, Meryl Wasney, was at Georgetown University for a lot of that time and, and then lives in West Lafayette part-time. After she retired, she stayed connected. She comes here often. She's an adjunct faculty member. Okay. So how did you compile, or how did you decide on that team? Like, were a lot of the people just here and they were great and so it worked out really well? Or did you have some selection process on like how you identified who you wanted to be in the research team? Well, um, so I had started working already with Monroe Peacock, the study physician, and George McCabe in statistics. So that was sort of a natural. I had hired Berdine Martin to be my lab manager in the middle 80s, so she started on some other studies we were doing, and so she was in place, and my lab manager was in place, and Olivia Wood was on faculty, who could be a research dietitian and trained dietetics men. So it was sort of opportunistic of who was here, mm -hmm. and then it was just such a wonderful group. And you just worked well together, yep. so everyone wanted to stay on. Yep. Okay, yeah, it was great. just really great. That's awesome. And we trained so many people. We, I've ha had thirty-nine PhD students and twenty oh, wow. master students and hundreds of undergraduates and twelve visiting professors, I think, and mm -hmm. seventeen honors students and wow. just trained so many people. And did they help with the campus? Your campus Most of them well. did help. Not not every one of them, but oh. most of them wow. did help. And even if they were doing another project, when camp occurred, they would do some role or the other. It's such a big effort. And our lab helps each other a lot anyway. So if somebody was doing an animal study and there was a really busy day, all the people would go help with that. And okay. then they would help with the human study. Oh, okay. You know, um, so they'd get some cross-training. Okay. So it was a really, like, helpful environment. Right. Awesome. Right. Um, did, so this was a fairly new method to acquire data, um, right? There's like, been a few, there's been a few metabolic research studies in children, but nothing of this magnitude and certainly not sustained and not with on top of it all the stable calcium isotopes to look at the kinetics. Um, it's pretty unique in the whole world, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Has anyone else taken up this method of study, studying? Like I said, there's been a one-off metabolic study here or there mm -hmm. with children that may be short, like yeah. a week or something. Okay. Um, but nothing of this magnitude. Okay. Mm. Um, and then so from this, um, you actually played a role in setting policy and informing guidelines internationally. 
in relation to like calcium intake, right? Or yeah. Well, a lot of different things, but um, <laughs> prim most dominantly calcium yep. because um, we set the calcium requirements for adolescents for North America, and uh, many countries don't have the ability to conduct research or the investment or infrastructure to do the research like this to collect the data. So often they would just adopt okay. the North American um, so numbers, yeah. Or, but a lot of times when I would get invited to consult with government or industry or academics internationally, it was, okay, so how do we implement this? You know, like in Asia they would say, uh, our people don't consume dairy and that's the major source of calcium, so okay. uh, would you help advise us on whether we should fortify some staple food okay. with calcium? And sometimes it was on vitamin D or mm -hmm. some other nutrient I had some experience with. But oh, okay. And so you would, would you help them come up with these methods on how to increase people's calcium intake? I would, yeah, help like advise the their plans or give oh, them okay. ideas and yeah. Wow. That's, so this has been really significant for, if, at least I know like North American health, right? Like so you've, as a kid, like I grew up in, you know, the 80s and 90s, so focusing on like getting enough calcium was always big in my childhood. Right, and so right. And get it for school, like you have the milk programs at school and everything like that. Did this help influence that? So let me tell you how directly it did. Um, the dietary guidelines for Americans dictate the nutritional uh, requirements by law for any federal funding exposure. So the dietary guidelines evaluates the literature every five years and they take the nutrient requirements. And so any dollar spent on any federal food program has to follow the dietary guidelines. So that means all school lunches and school breakfasts and military and nutrition okay. for the elderly program. And so if you have a meal, like a school lunch or school breakfast, you have to get one third of what the dietary guidelines recommendations oh, are. Okay. Or you lose the funding that comes out of USDA for supporting that school lunch or school breakfast. And there is an assessment program to make sure you did. Mm -hmm. So every school intentionally looks at what are their requirements mm -hmm. and follows that and proves they follow it or, or yeah. they're at risk for much Losing. money <laughs> yeah. loss because it's a law. Okay. So that's how directly wow. these data influence what happens. Yeah. So oh, one, yeah. <laughs> one other, uh, I mean, it's smaller than that, but one other uh, direct influence we had with school lunch is um, before we did the study, they didn't allow any alternatives to milk for, okay. for calcium sources okay. in school lunches. They thought from the literature, but it was all test tube studies, not anything with humans, that calcium from soy milk or soy beverage was not well absorbed, okay. so they wouldn't allow it. So we did a study with the most um, commonly consumed form of soy milk that was on the market, put it in the isotope in the form and got it labeled and fed it and saw that it was equal to cow's milk in oh, the form and the processing procedure used in the common form. So then they changed the legislation and allowed that as an alternative to cow's milk for a source of calcium in oh. the schools. Oh, great. So well, that would help with a lot of like, lacto like allergies. Cause it, right. Yeah. It, or whatever reason, you know, yeah. that would help. But none of the other plant-based beverages have been studied, so I okay. uh, hope to do that in the future. Oh, okay. So that's mm -hmm. up next, maybe? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to jump, well, I guess not jump back too far. So you were appointed um, head of the Department of 
was it nutrition science at that time? It, it was foods and nutrition foods at that time. Um, in 1991. Um, what were some of the new, like, did you implement any new um, programs or, or um, yeah, any, like, undergraduate or graduate programs at that time? So let me tell you about the start. It, in lots of ways, we were kind of a sleepy, not very well recognized okay. department at that time. Um, and I wanted to start s some initiatives like you're asking about. So I knew I was going to become head and organized a retreat in the summer for the faculty and put out in advance some of the ideas that we had been sort of talking about but never actually acted on. Um, but possibilities and assign different people to lead discussions of the different areas and had groups formed in the teams and said, before the retreat, why don't you do some benchmarking from uh, comparing what other campuses do and have some meetings and st start thinking about what you want to talk about with the faculty and so forth. So we went to Turkey Run and had a retreat and at the end of the retreat we had a five-year plan of what all we wanted to accomplish and proceeded to do it all in the next year and a half wow. because they were so <laughs> excited and empowered to do these programs so some of the things we accomplished we st uh, started an interdepartmental nutrition graduate program okay. that still is in existence today mm -hmm. that's a very strong program and uh, an undergraduate major in nutrition, fitness, and health, which sort of combined dietetics and uh, fitness okay. and exercise so you could be more holistic in running oh, okay. programs. And that's still in existence today, too. We've got a lot of collaboration and appointed adjunct faculty from health kinesiology oh, faculty okay. to do that. Um, so that's two of the main things that came out of that. Wow. And so that um, nutrition and fitness collaboration, like that mm -hmm. program, that's pretty progressive for the time. Like that's something that I'm starting to hear, I think, a bit more about now. But so we advertised it to um, high school counselors and mm -hmm grew it to 77 people, majors in about a year. <laughs> so that was really popular. That's really good experiential training too. That's awesome. It's really nice. And then all during, so you were ahead of the one, you're still a professor. So you're, yeah, so you're still a professor, you're head of department, of foods and nutrition, you're running Camp Calcium, but then you also started the Botanical Research Center, yeah. <laughs> one of the many centers that you were. Yeah, we'll talk about the <laughs> centers in a minute, but you know, I just had great people to work with. Yeah. I'm, I'm a delegator, and like the leading part, I don't, I like to empower people and let them create a lot of what they do and not get in their way so much. So I had wonderful assistant to the head and I had three different ones and the more recent one that retired is Marlene Troyer, okay. who's a real asset. Um, they all were. And then Bertie Martin was running my lab mm -hmm. and uh, Don Hahn was my personal assistant and just great people that yeah. could help lead, but the faculty were all having a lot of fun working together, so we accomplished a lot. We, we grew. Um, my predecessor department head, Paula Abernathy, had talked Avenel Kirksey into oh, okay. writing the first externally funded grants to our department, oh, okay. so it, we weren't a well-known research machine at all, or we hadn't really integrated around campus very much. So he asked Avenel Kirksey, write an external grant, and she said, where to, NIH or USDA? And he said, well, both. She wrote one to each, got them both, and that wow. like started our <laughs> external grants. She, 
so the first two female distinguished professors at Purdue came out of our department, Helen Clark and Ann Avenel okay. Kirksey. Um, but she was about the only one. There was hardly any other external grant getters. And at one point, I remember we had 13 faculty that were PIs of R01 NIH grants. Oh, you know, wow. we just really grew and expanded and um, that money that came in, the salary savings from those grants, and a corporate affiliates program that um, oh, I yeah. started in the department, we can talk about too, um, were sources of revenue beyond what was actually uh, budgeted for our department to have. So we could hire, we hired up to nine uh, instructors to help with teaching, to help free faculty up to write grants. And okay. that would grow the number of grads since we get a Ford and technicians and mm -hmm. whatnot. So we need a lot more space. So one of the ways we got more space initially was when the library started decentralizing, we put in a proposal along with anthropology um, and our dean at the time, Dennis Saviano, helped engineer this idea where we would combine with this other college interest to acquire that space. So lots of, we got two thirds of the library and anthropology got um, okay. a third of the space to make a department head suite for them. And our space was for all these, a lot of these new people that okay. we brought in all these clinical and uh, instructor teaching staff and uh, we started getting sp other kinds of space research space all over uh, stone hall and matthews and eventually oh, okay. lyle's porter and different oh, places so spread out. and uh, right smith hall oh, okay. and different spaces that we need because we we grew so rapidly in mm -hmm. such a short time and then eventually we got the clinical research space that we'll talk about a little bit later when we talk about the CTSI. Okay. <laughs> we can do that. But, um, yeah, other programs that we built together, um, a big clinical research operation and center, the corporate affiliates, which was a membership-based um, industry partnership okay. program. So all kinds of recognizable and unrecognizable names. So if you go down the grocery store, you recognize Kraft and Kellogg's and yeah. um, that kind of General Foods, that kind of name. But you might not recognize the ingredient companies that sell to those kind of companies oh, okay. or the dietary supplement companies like Pharmavite, which, make, which makes ma Nature Made. You might recognize Nature Made, but you might not recognize Pharmavite. The, yeah produces these. So all kinds of companies were attracted to become partners with us because we would expose them to research before it was actually published and they could be okay. ahead of the was, game kind of and so much of the important research was being done yeah. at, in our department and at Purdue and we were um, becoming involved with these policy setting um, assignments and they would learn about that from us that enrich their jobs and we just had a lot of fun so we, we would invite them to campus for a symposia twice a year and they would enjoy being on campus enjoy being together and with us and meet students and hire students and a lot of mutual things but we there were membership fees for belonging so oh, okay. that was uh, unrestricted funds that we could use to help us populate these expanding spaces with computers or oh, or equipment. Yeah. We didn't use it for salaries so much, oh, okay. but because the salaries mostly came either from the grants directly or from salary savings to help okay. with teaching and um, the activities the faculty needed to free up their time to okay. be more involved in research. So we just really expanded our reach. We also developed the Hall of Fame where we would recognize distinguished alumni or friends, okay. you know, maybe five or six a year, and they would become 
closer ambassadors and ties, potential donors, but mostly the good relationships. And we um, had a May conference before, which was a accreditation outreach program, but we really um, built that up and coupled it with the Hall of Fame. So some of the famous people, alums who had become famous, we would okay. invite to come be speakers in our day of continuing education, okay. our symposia for health professionals in, around the state. Okay. And then that evening we would honor them in their Hall of Fame. Okay. So. And are these alums, were they specifically from the Department of Foods yeah. and Nutrition? Yeah. Okay, so it was people yeah. who were right. famous or well-known in that. Right, okay. or accomplished something yeah. special. and. Okay. So there's a plaque, a wall with a big plaque with mm -hmm. all the years of the different awardees. Okay. And is that still going on? It is. Awesome. Yeah. And that's something that you cre you came up with? Yes. Wow. Yeah. And so... Well, I stole it from uh, <laughs> ABE on campus because uh, oh, okay. their department had done that. And, or I don't know that their style was like ours. I mean, we have... Uh, flautists and uh, piano players and yeah. things, you know, and uh, qu quite the elaborate festival yeah. festivity. But the idea of recognizing, yeah, you know, I stole from A B. Yeah. yeah, right. Awesome. And then for the corporate affiliates program, yeah, was that just so you held symposiums, one each term, right? So like a fall yeah. and a spring, right? Um, and it was so people or companies paid membership and they would come in and you just, it was like a presenting your research kind of day. So you would like tell them about upcoming nutrition research that- It was them. it was some of that, but some of it was around themes, like okay. little mini symposia. And we would bring in people from the government who ran okay. uh, these programs or nationally renowned speakers or people mm -hmm. in, who are influencers so we could use some of the membership fees then to support the entire program okay. as well as have extra to invest into okay. our infrastructure okay. in the department okay so it was kind of like it was in one respect like revenue right or like a revenue stream but then it was also like partnerships educating. well educating, educating and corporate. it was partnerships because yeah. The problems that we face are, with health are complex, mm -hmm. you know, and multifactorial. And if we don't work together, mm -hmm. you can't solve the problem. Like in academia alone, we can get as far as um, a research publication that could yeah. go on the shelf, you know, yeah. or we could maybe sit on a policy committee like the dietary guidelines that I was mm -hmm. telling you about influences all school lunches and school programs. That's really effective. But who really influences the food supply are these manufacturers that yeah. put all the foods in the grocery store or that you can get online or whatnot. So if we don't influence them, we have a lot smaller reach mm -hmm. than if we can influence the products that okay. they produce. How did you come up with this idea? It's brilliant. Like, I think it's really a great way to kind of that like, yeah, to like influence and educate manufacturers on foods. So chemistry has uh, a program that's kind of like that, that's older than ours. And food science has an industrial um, associates program that's sort of in that model. Mm -hmm. So we're not completely original at Purdue, but probably how we do it is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And we had many more companies Yeah. that were interested in nutrition. Okay. Okay. And was this affiliated with the other centers or was this separate corporate affiliates program? It was separate from the centers or did it align with them? So, yes and no. Okay. <laughs> so it was really a separate entity. Okay. But uh, often I would combine purposes. So um, there's a lot of energy in synergizing. So for, I guess one of the things that our department was really known best for during my area was uh, events. 
that would bring lots of people on campus together, but also across the nation with industry, government, academia. And so if I had an event that was associated with the Botanicals Research Center or the Women's Global Health Institute, I would often combine that with one of the visits for the corporate affiliates. Okay. So they, they might have some period of time where it was only corporate affiliates or only one of these centers, but the symposium, the public part, was um, hosted together. And that generated a lot of audience together, Mm -hmm. a lot of activity, which is really great for students. If they have a poster session and you have all these industry and government people and scientists from all these disciplines coming by your poster, it's very exciting. Mm -hmm. And lots of job opportunities, too. And sometimes funding. And, And like I would combine perspective graduate student visitation day with a corporate affiliates program. And so a prospective graduate student would go to a poster session and see industry folks looking at the poster and asking if they could help fund the next round of ideas oh, while they're wow. sitting there. And they're sitting there, oh, if I go into this research lab, I'm already hearing that craft or you know, some company is so interested in this that they might want to fund it and then adopt it commercially. I mean, that's very enticing Mm -hmm. to a prospective graduate student. It looked like we had lots going on, lots of action. Yeah, you did have lots going on. We did. Yeah. We did. And then you had tons of grad students and undergrads. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Okay, so we're back. Um, so, Connie, I just had a few other questions about your time um, as head of the Department of Foods and Nutrition. Um, so, what other fundraising opportunities, if any, did you develop when you were head of that department? So, the main one was towards the end. Now, the department was called Nutrition Science by okay. that time, and uh, a Department of Food Science had been created on campus, so it seemed appropriate to narrow ours down to nutrition science. And I wanted a longer term legacy financially. We had these source revenues coming in from lots of success with external funding and the corporate affiliates, but they weren't going to last indefinitely. And it was, is it would be so nice as a department head to have some cash reserves to spend. For example, our expenditures exceeded our budget by two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand dollars a year. Mm-hmm. So that's how much money every year I was raising through corporate affiliates, and we were collectively raising through salary savings. That's a lot of money to expect it to keep on going just indefinitely. So one of the things I started doing was taking about a third of the revenue of corporate affiliates and putting it into an an account that would start growing. But that was still going to produce a fairly small annual income if any of these sources dried up. So I wanted to do a big fundraising effort And at the time, the university wasn't involved in fundraising for that period of time. So the college had no distractions of other, the development officers had nothing else to do. So (laughs) not not very much. I mean, they they were still cultivating relationships, but there was no campus-wide fundraising uh, effort going on. So they could really spend a lot of time helping our department with ours Mm -hmm. and we raised 12 million dollars wow i know so the return on investment for the that the interest is should should end up to be a fair amount of money over time now some of it's in estate Mm -hmm. gifts and so it's not Sorry, that probably yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> got you off track. So um, you had put, 
you had some, you had raised twelve million dollars, right? And then it was some there. of it to be realized later because mm-hmm. it's an estate gift. But we wanted to celebrate what we had accomplished and to recognize even more alums than the Hall of Fame and to have a big party. We really had never had where we invited um, just all of our alumni to come for an event. So we advertised to have a gala and we worked very hard on producing a formal, very nice gala. And it coincided with a 110 year anniversary of our department. So that's how we build it. And we selected 110 diamonds from alumni and friends and uh, people who had been important to the department to recognize Mm -hmm. in the program. And we had um, a lot of fun. We had silent um, auction and uh, all sorts of photography experiences and a formal dinner in the union and Mm -hmm. everybody dressed up and um, that day we had all kinds of activities. We emulated the uh, maypole, you know, from the really long time ago and showed off a lot of different things that people who hadn't been back to campus for a while wouldn't would know about in our department and we inaugurated we dedicated the clinical research center which was quite the undertaking we have a world-class clinical research center now that took us being selected as one of six uh, repair and remodeling projects funded by the state each year for three years in a row because it was that expensive. So uh, Keith Moore told us we were gonna accomplish this because of all we had accomplished and contributed to research and how we had really made a splash with clinical nutrition research. Mm -hmm. And so they were gonna do this for us. But um, so it's a space I'm very proud of. The Clinical Research Center. Correct. Amazing. And then so this $12 million that you raised, was it from the gala or was this how It was a two-year process going into the gala, but. Okay. And then so how did you raise funds? Like did you. So we we had um, some planned newsletters that went to the alumni Mm -hmm. building up and featuring certain accomplishments and uh, we it just all the ways that development and we could think of to advertise and of course there were opportunities at the gala and to follow up with we started a um, Purdue alumni network okay program there so people could sign up and now they can be on social media and learn from, yeah. from what each other are doing that sort of oh, thing cool and then so was this gala like a one-time event yes okay awesome yeah and then how did it turn out about 400 people came wow yeah which was really awesome. really a good turnout our department's not all that big but so that was um, yeah. what we had hoped is something like that. Awesome. That's great. Um, is there anything else from your time as department head that you want to mention? Mm, I think we covered the things I had noted. Okay. Great. Um, and then I guess just one. One. I have one more yeah, thing that I sure. wrote down. It is. Uh, the kind of st- strategic planning I like to do the best were more action items or dreaming statements. Okay. You know, rather than the more formal, we did some of that too, but more like, if you had a dream and unlimited resources, what would you want to happen in our department? Okay. And one of the most precious comments I got in this activity from the faculty was, if in five years we would have the same staff then as we have now. (laughs) Isn't that lovely? Yeah. And I guess, well, it sounds like you accomplished that Mm because you had 20, over 20 years, you had almost 
a lot of the same staff who are working together on Camp Calcium, right? Well, faculty, but also support staff yeah. in the department, and yeah. they overlap, but not the same as Camp yeah. Calcium. So for the department, too, yeah. it was like a big family. Yeah.